Hey everyone, ready for a deep dive into something truly mind-boggling? I'm excited. We're tackling the hard problem of consciousness. Mm. And trust me, this isn't just some philosophy 101 recap. We're going deep. But I promise, no existential crisis is required on this journey. Yeah, you send us some really interesting stuff to dive into, so let's see if we can get a little closer to understanding, you know, this whole being aware thing. Yeah, it's really fascinating how we're using science the tools of, you know, the observable, the measurable, right. to try and understand something that's incredibly personal and subjective, you know, what it feels like to be conscious. Totally. Like, I know my brain is doing all this stuff, mm -hmm. but how does that become me experiencing the world? Right. That's where this whole heart problem thing comes in. Yeah. Like, I keep seeing it everywhere. Yeah. What exactly were we talking about here? So the philosopher David Chalmers, he coined this term hard problem. It describes the challenge of explaining why and how these physical processes in the brain actually give rise to subjective experience. So we can explain, for example, how light hits your retina signals travel to your brain. But explaining why that creates the experience of seeing red, that's the hard problem. So it's like, yeah, we could build a robot that reacts to light. Mm-hmm. But does it actually see red? Does it feel anything? Right. That's what we're really grappling with. Exactly. And that's why it's so hard. It's not just about figuring out the mechanics of the brain. Right. We're really trying to bridge this gap between the physical world and that inner subjective world of experience. So neuroscience is doing a great job figuring out the quote unquote easy problems. Mm. You know, how the brain processes information, controls our body. Yeah. But explaining the feeling itself, that's a whole other thing. Absolutely. And what makes it even trickier is this idea that just relying on physical explanations might not be enough. Hmm. Chalmers actually argued that it's completely conceivable to have a system that acts exactly like a human, but without any conscious experience. So it's like a philosophical hmm. zombie, you know, looks and acts just like us. Oh. But there's nobody home inside. The zombies. Okay, so this is where it gets really interesting for me. But wait, hold on. If a philosophical zombie is actually possible, uh, doesn't that suggest that there's something more to consciousness than just the physical stuff? That's one of the big implications. The challenge is the idea that everything can be boiled down to physical processes, this view called materialism or physicalism. Right. So maybe there's something else going on, something we can't quite grasp with our current scientific tools. I'm also curious about some of those other thought experiments that you mentioned, like inverted qualia. Oh, yeah. Like, what if my experience of red is completely different from yours and we'd never know? Yeah, qualia are those subjective, qualitative feelings of experience. Okay. So imagine biting into a strawberry. The sweetness, the redness, the juiciness. Right. Those are qualia. Now imagine if my experience of red is what you experience as blue. Whoa. Our brains would be processing the same wavelength of light, but the feeling itself would be totally different. Yeah, we'd be walking around and we would have no idea. Right. That's a crazy thought. It highlights the limitations of using purely objective measures to understand something that's inherently subjective. And there's another thought experiment, Mary's Room, that kind of drives this point home even further. Imagine a brilliant neuroscientist, Mary Bear, she knows everything there is to know about color vision, okay. the physics, the biology, the whole shebang. But here's the catch. She's lived her entire life in a black and white room. Okay, so she knows about color, but she's never actually seen color. Exactly. Now the question is, when Mary finally steps out of that room and sees a red apple for the first time, does she learn something new? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> she has all the scientific knowledge, so you would think she'd know exactly what to expect. But on the other hand, actually experiencing red does seem like it would be different. Yeah. Like maybe science can only take you so far. That's the heart of the argument. Mary's room suggests there's a difference between knowing the facts about something and actually having the subjective experience. And it kind of circles back to this idea that maybe purely physical explanations can't fully capture the fullness of consciousness. Right. My brain is officially doing backflips right now. It's a lot to take in. We've got philosophical zombies. We've got color confusion. We've got... A scientist breaking free from her monochrome world. Yeah. And this is just the beginning. We've only just scratched the surface. There are so many ways philosophers and scientists have tried to tackle this hard problem, from those who say it doesn't even exist to those who think consciousness is like a fundamental part of the universe. Okay, so we've got a lot more to uncover. We do. Let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll explore some of these different approaches. It feels like every time we kind of peel back a layer of this consciousness onion, there's another layer underneath. 
But I think we can make some sense of it. So we can look at these different approaches that people have taken to grapple with this hard problem. And thankfully, David Chalmers came up with a handy taxonomy to kind of categorize these different approaches. Okay, a taxonomy. So it's like we're classifying the different species yeah. of solutions to the hard problem. Exactly. So where do we begin with this mind map? What are the major categories? Well, one major dividing line is between those who think the answer lies within the realm of the physical, mm -hmm. the materialists, right. and those who think we need to go beyond the physical, the dualists. So the materialists are all about the brain, and the dualists are saying there's something more, something non-physical involved. Exactly. Let's start with the materialists. Chalmers calls the first group type A materialists. Okay. And they're the ones who say, you know, hey, there is no hard problem. Consciousness is just what the brain does. Uh -huh. Solve the easy problems and the hard problem just disappears. So it's like once we figure out all the neural circuits and how they fire, we'll see that consciousness is nothing more than a complex machine just whirring away. That's the gist of it. Okay. They argue that our feeling that consciousness is mysterious is simply because we don't fully understand the brain yet. There's a subset of these type A materialists that are called strong reductionists. Okay. And they believe that once we have a complete scientific explanation of the brain, our intuitions about this hard problem will simply vanish. So they think it's a problem with our understanding, not with reality itself. Exactly. But what about the feeling that there's something unique and irreducible about experience? Do they have an answer for that? Well, some type of materialists take an even more radical stance. Okay. They're called eliminative materialists. Mm -hmm. And they actually argue that consciousness, as we typically conceive of it, is an illusion, a product of this outdated folk psychology. Hold on. So they're saying that we're not actually conscious. Well, it does sound counterintuitive. Yeah. But their point is that our current way of talking about consciousness might be misleading. They believe that as neuroscience advances, we'll develop a new vocabulary, a new understanding of the brain that will completely replace our current fuzzy concept of consciousness. Okay, so I can kind of see where they're coming from, mm -hmm. but it still feels like there's a piece of the puzzle missing. Yeah. What about those who acknowledge that there is this hard problem, but think it's more about how our brains are wired? That brings us to type B materialism. Okay. And they accept that consciousness is this genuine puzzle, but they argue that the problem lies with how our brains have evolved, not with reality itself. Okay. So we might be hardwired to misunderstand the relationship between mind and matter. So it's like our brains are trying to grasp something that they're not equipped to fully comprehend. Exactly. Okay. Type B materialists suggest that even if we knew everything about the brain, there might still be an explanatory gap. It's not that consciousness is a separate thing, but rather that our evolved brains might never have the right conceptual tools to fully grasp how it emerges from the physical world. All right, that's a bit humbling. It is. But what about those who are maybe a bit more optimistic about science's ability to crack this code? Well, that's type C materialism for you. Okay. This group believes that with enough time and research, science will eventually solve the hard problem. So they're the, we'll figure it out eventually camp. I like their optimism. You know, science has solved some pretty mind-boggling mysteries in the past, so maybe they're right. Yeah. What about those who think that the answer lifts beyond the physical world altogether? That brings us to the dualists. Okay. Specifically type D dualism. Okay. This view sees consciousness as fundamentally different from the physical world. So there's a separation, a duality between mind and matter. So we're talking about like the mind-body split here. You got it. Substance dualism, famously championed by Rene Descartes, posits that mind and body are two distinct substances that somehow interact with each other. Right. So I think, therefore, I am. Yes. But how do these two substances, mind and body, how do they connect? That seems like a whole other mystery. It is. A, that's one of the major challenges for substance dualism. Another form of dualism is property dualism, which says that there's only one kind of stuff. Okay. The physical stuff. But it can have both physical and mental properties. Okay. So in this view, consciousness is a non-physical property that arises from certain complex physical systems like brains. So it's like consciousness is an extra feature that comes along with certain physical arrangements. But if it's not physical, how do we even study it? That's a question that keeps philosophers and scientists up at night. Yeah, I bet. And then there's another category, type F monism, which throws a real curveball into the mix. Okay. This view suggests that consciousness isn't just an emergent property. It's fundamental to reality itself. Wait, 
So instead of consciousness arising from matter, matter arises from consciousness. You're catching on. Okay. It's a pretty radical departure from the usual way of thinking. This category includes ideas like panpsychism, which suggests that even tiny particles might possess a glimmer of consciousness. Whoa. So it's like everything is connected by this field of consciousness. It's a wild idea, right? But some philosophers and even physicists are exploring this possibility. It's really a testament to the mind-bending nature of this hard problem. It pushes us to consider ideas that seem completely out there. My brain is officially fried. We've covered a lot of ground here, from those who deny the hard problem even exists to those who think that consciousness is like woven into the fabric of the universe. We have. It's clear there's no easy answer. Absolutely. But even with all this philosophical debate, scientists haven't just been sitting around pondering the mysteries of the mind. They've been hard at work trying to pinpoint the neural activity that correlates with consciousness. So we're going from like philosophical zombies to brain scans. That's right. Okay, so we've been in the philosophy zone with a hard problem. All mm -hmm. those what ifs and yeah. thought experiments, you know, it's enough to make you question reality. Yeah. But I'm guessing that neuroscientists aren't just like sitting around having these existential crises. Right. They're actually looking for clues right inside the brain. Oh, absolutely. They're like detectives trying to find those neural fingerprints of consciousness. One of the most exciting areas of research is the hunt for what's called the neural correlates of consciousness, or NCCs for short. It's, easy. it's basically trying to pinpoint the specific brain activity that goes hand in hand with conscious experience. I like it. NCCs has got a good ring to it. But how do they even go about finding these neural fingerprints? Are we talking like sticking electrodes in people's brains? Well, thankfully, we have some less invasive tools these days. Brain imaging techniques like fMRI let us see which brain regions light up when someone is having a particular experience, say, seeing a red apple or feeling a touch. So are they finding any smoking guns? Like, aha, that's the part of the brain that makes you feel conscious. It's not quite that simple, unfortunately. Consciousness isn't localized to a single spot in the brain. It's more like an orchestra with different regions kind of playing their parts to create this symphony of experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It doesn't feel like one thing happening in my head. Right. It feels like a whole brain thing. Exactly. And that's where theories like integrated information theory or IIT come in. This theory was developed by Giulio Tononi and suggests that consciousness isn't just about individual neurons firing, but about how those neurons are connected and sharing information. So the more interconnected and integrated a system is, the more conscious it is. So it's like my brain isn't just like a bunch of separate parts doing their own thing. It's the way those parts are all talking to each other. Yeah. The complexity of that network that gives rise to consciousness. That's the core idea. And what's really intriguing is they've even come up with a mathematical measure for this integrated information, which is denoted by the Greek letter phi. Wait, so we can actually measure consciousness? That's what IIT proposes, although it's very much a work in progress. It sparked a lot of debate and research because it raises this possibility that consciousness exists on a spectrum, you know, from simple organisms with a tiny bit of integrated information to complex brains with a lot of it. So maybe even something like a tree has like a tiny little flicker of consciousness, according to this theory. That's right. And it ties back to what we were talking about with panpsychism. Right. That IIT kind of offers this potential framework for how consciousness could be this fundamental property of many systems, not just brains. Okay, my brain is officially in awe. What about that theater analogy? I remember reading something about consciousness being like a global workspace. Ah, yes. Global workspace theory. This one proposes that consciousness is like a spotlight shining on the stage of your brain. Okay. All sorts of unconscious processing is happening backstage, but only the information that's deemed important for conscious awareness gets illuminated on that stage. So consciousness is like the star of the show, the main event that our brains are putting on. Exactly. This theory really emphasizes the role of consciousness in integrating information from different brain areas and making it available for decision making and action. So we have all these different theories trying to tackle this problem from all these different angles. But isn't there still that fundamental mystery of consciousness? Can science ever really explain what it feels like to be conscious? That's the million dollar question. And it brings us right back to that pesky hard problem. Remember David Chalmers, the one who coined the term hard problem? 
Well, he later introduced what he calls the meta problem of consciousness. A meta problem. Okay, now things are getting even more meta than usual. Right. What's that about? It's essentially the problem of explaining why we even think there is a hard problem in the first place. So why do our brains create the sense of mystery around consciousness? So instead of trying to solve the hard problem, we're questioning why we even think it's a problem. Precisely. It's a real head spinner. But it highlights this fact that even our perception of the hard problem might itself be a product of how our brains are wired. Officially mind blown. I think we've reached peak deep dive for today. This has been incredible. We've gone from philosophical zombies to brain scans, from qualia to like the idea that maybe even rocks have a glimmer of awareness. It's been wild. I think what's so remarkable is that even if we never fully solve the hard problem, the very act of exploring it, grappling with these questions, really expands our understanding of what it means to be human. Well said. And who knows, maybe someday a, a future Einstein of consciousness will come along and illuminate all these mysteries we're still wrestling with today. I love that thought. Yeah, me too. Until then, we just keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep. You've been listening to The Deep Dive, folks. We hope this journey into the world of consciousness has left you buzzing with curiosity and with a renewed appreciation for the incredible mystery that is your own awareness. Until next time, keep those brain cells firing and those aha moments coming.